I'm Deirdre Woods, and uh, this has been a very interesting adventure. I work at Penn, and we've primarily uh, partnered with Coursera at this point. Howard and I were talking uh, just before uh, we started our presentation, and we agreed we were the grizzled old experienced people in this field because, Howard, you started in July, and I started last June. So this is the, this is these you, one measures uh, one's strategic planning processes in like perhaps weeks or months, and your tactical planning is maybe hourly in this project. Um, I would really add to the conversations that occurred uh, yesterday and this morning about librarians getting involved. Uh, this is still so early on in this adventure, um, and there's plenty of opportunity to, to really participate in, and really shape the conversation about open education. Um, and if you need another reason to join in, um, I have found this one of the most interesting projects in my entire professional career. Uh, so if, you, if you're looking for something exciting uh, to do at, at your job, I, I would also encourage you to get involved in this because it is some fascinating stuff. If we, I was here a year from now, we'd be probably be talking about something completely different, which I don't yet know what it is. So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what we're doing here at Penn. We, I have some data to show you and sort of where we're going. So just quickly, some of, I know a lot of you were here yesterday when uh, Ed presented, uh, my colleague Ed Rock, but um, we're doing, we, were, we jumped off the cliff, as it were, into the world of massively open online courses at Penn for several reasons. You know, as institutions, as universities, we create and disseminate knowledge. This is our primary mission. Um, we create and disseminate knowledge and service to society, and, and uh, many of our courses, um, you know, indicate our real service to society about knowledge, dissemination, creation from, uh, you know, a course such as vaccines you heard about, to healthcare policy, uh, to, uh, you know, showing the enduring value of the liberal arts in terms of uh, having successful humanities courses such as Greek and Roman mythology and modern and contemporary American poetry. Who knew? Uh, driving teaching innovation is very important to us. Um, I think Lynn had said earlier in her presentation um, that we have also seen for every faculty member who does work uh, in open online courses, they take something back home to campus and have an imp a positive impact on what they're doing here and in our in real life classes, as we like to call them now. And you know, expanding our global reach. I mean, we are a world-class institution. It is important for everyone to know about Penn and the innovations that occur at Penn that change the world. Um, uh, one of the more interesting things we've seen in um, the world of openly, open online courses is that students are increasingly using this as a co part of their college tour. I mean, you all know this. You have children who did this yourselves. You went on college tours. They're all the same. They all say the same thing. They show you the pretty door, the one pretty dorm, you know, the one nice quad, and so on and so forth. But students are actually, what better way to learn about your, the institution you're interested in, in, interested in than going to take a course or part of a course on an openly op open platform? Form. That's that's really where the learning goes, and you really get to understand what's going on at this institution. So so far, so okay. So so I talked to our friends at Coursera, so I have some data for you, hot off the charts. Uh, Overall, Coursera, demographics here, it's trending very male. Uh, the age group is similar to what Howard talked about here. You're, you know, you're looking at the age group between 20 and 40 mostly. Um, but I have some more in-depth data in a bit to show you about some PAN courses. Uh, you probably all saw this on Nature, um, just was published recently in terms of what's going on in Coursera. Um, uh, close to 3 million users on Coursera on the platform at this point. Uh, over 300 plus courses with uh, many of you who are new partners. Um, um, in Coursera, um, a quarter, a third of the population is North America based. We have seen this consistently, um, and we, we see this in our courses as well. I think one interesting thing um, that is true on the Coursera platform, and I think probably with your participation will become increasingly to those of you who are using Coursera at your institutions, is only a quarter of the courses are information technology courses. I think we think a lot about you know tech courses and programming courses being available, and which are which is a great application for them. But there's there's a, there's quite a bit of other stuff going on on the platform, and, and Penn is one of the uh, big contributors in in this space. So a little bit more about us, uh, um, uh, 840 enrollments, that probably gets down to about 600,000 actual individual users. Uh, we've completed 11 courses. As I said, we're the grizzled experienced people in this space. Uh, we're, our our uh, calculus course will be finishing up in April. We launched our ADHD course uh, yesterday, um, and we'll be launching a, a bunch of courses into the spring and summer. We're re-offering many of our courses as well due to popular demand. Um, um, and we we have an entire proposal process in place for courses into 2014 and, and hopefully beyond. 
So a little bit about us, uh, what we're doing. Um, I, I think what's been really great about uh, working so far in this arena is that an institution like Penn really gets to demonstrate its breadth and depth of expertise across so many disciplines. Again, we go from ADHD to uh, you know uh, calculus to modern poetry to uh, a course on cardiac arrest, Greek and Roman mythology. As you heard, Christian yesterday, operations management, um, and so it, it gives us an opportunity to do this. I think the other thing that we've learned um, from from our faculty, we've learned several things from our faculty members. First of all, yes, it is a ton of work to create these courses. But most of our faculty members who have taught a Coursera course have said, oh, wow, it was so much work, I can't wait to do it again. <laughs> it literally, in one, like without even taking a breath. And you sort of heard a little bit about that when Christian Turvish was talking yesterday. Um, uh, and... Um, you know, teaching courses at in, 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 in institutions are hard, right? You have a, a semester schedule. You have so much content you need to deliver to your student population a certain amount of time. You have to assess them and grade them in a certain way. And even though your faculty members are in some ways exposing themselves to, you know, t tens or maybe even hundreds of thousands of participants, and that's kind of a scary leap. The other side of it is these plat platforms like these provide tremendous opportunity for experimentation. You want to teach a six-week course? Great. You want to teach a longer course? Great. You want to mess around with assessments? Uh, great. Because, you know, this, the, the bar is a little different. You know, you're, you're generating certificates, statements of accomplishment, and so on and so forth. But you're, you're not so tied to a schedule. You're not so tied to students crying in your office about getting that B plus instead of the A. It happens here at Penn a lot. Um, you know, and so, and then you're able, you're able to, you have a lot more flexibility. And then you can take some of your learning and bring it back to a more, tradi a more traditional campus format. Um, let's see. So I want to just get into some course data for you. So this is our design course. This is taught by uh, Wharton professor Carl Ulrich. Um, my colleague Amy Bennett over here, you taught her yesterday. She was a TA for this course. Um, we relatively had about 6,000 students replying. So, you know, it falls out a little differently in terms of gender, which we thought was interesting. Age distribution, about the same. Um, one of the things we asked in this course is, what's, what are you doing in addition to your, like, kind of status? We had a lot of people who had jobs taking this course which was really fascinating. It was, it was an applied course about design, in which I think actually is every discipline needs to know about design, so a little pitch, it's coming up again in April. Um, but you know, talking about design, we had, we had designers from all over the world submitting homework assignments and so on and so forth. So I thought that was kind of interesting because we were, we were really hitting a demographic that uh, I had you know, people with real day jobs who took this course seriously. Um, a little bit about our world music course, very different course, liberal arts. Uh, what you'd probably see in terms of trend, we had a bigger sample size here. Age group, uh, a little different. But if you notice, we do have these 80 to 90 and over 90 that uh, you know that come in. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if these demographics change over time um, as, as as these courses are more widely adopted. Um, again, course stuff, you know, we have people with doctoral degrees taking these courses, kind of interesting stuff. Um, and then finally, I have uh, some data for a modern poetry course. Um, similar in some ways, uh, you know, poetry, English majors are more predominantly female. No surprise, we have a lot of adoption here and what's going on in poetry. Um, and then uh, we pulled uh, some data in terms of demographics. Once again, about a third North America. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, one thing we find that's interesting here is that really there are too many countries to mention. Once you get sort of past you know, the BRICS, you all of a sudden jump down into 0.01% you know, of countries because it literally is, the participation is literally from all over the world. Um, so Kristen talked a little bit about the data yesterday, and there's been a lot of discussion about, um, you know, enrollments versus in registrations versus completions, and so on and so forth. So uh, we, one of our wonderful colleagues here at Penn, sort of took it on himself to really start wading in this data. Um, so uh, so. Uh, and we we looked at every single course. We looked at the participation rates. What happens? So generally, what we what you see, and this I should probably show you the reverse graph of this is generally this is reflecting the people who are now we consider consider active users because there's a drop off. I think and a year ago when we started our courses or nine months ago when we started courses, there's this huge frenzy, right? It was almost like a speculator's market that everyone was clicking and signing up for courses and so on and so forth. And I really think there's going to be a little more reality 
uh, you know, now that these courses are going to be here, it's sustained a little bit longer. There are a lot of options for courses. You don't need to sit, click on every course. I think there's going to be a little more reality, and I think registrations are going to start meeting, you know, getting closer to enrollment rates. So once, depending on the course, you know, you you lose 20 to maybe even 50 percent of your population right away um, in terms of who you should really consider real students. Uh, the other thing that we've sort of seen is that while you have these very serious students, so the completion rates again are five to 10 percent. And I would really echo what Howard was talking about in terms of, um, but faculty members still have an opportunity to teach more students in their entire career in one course, serious students. So if you teach 7,000, 5,000, 8,000 students get, get certified, that's more students than a, probably a full professor would ever get to teach in their entire career, you know, a great professor who loves teaching in their entire career at Penn. Um, but one of the things... Even, even in addition to your serious students who do every single homework, who complete every exercise, take the exam, and are eligible for a statement of accomplishment or a certificate, we've also seen very cl clearly that you also have this other layer of students who do some stuff for the entire duration of their course as well. And that's another 30 to 40 percent of your student population who don't drop out, but they might not see every video because life they have a job or life gets in their way, and they may not do every assignment, but they also hang in. So... I, I think I think Christian said it very was really articulate yesterday talking about what we're going to do with this data and it's a little too early to see but I, th I think you know as faculty members think about courses and we think about you know really where we're going with this having this casual but kind of engaged user who sticks in with this course might be something we think about um, so as we continue looking at our we continue to t take a look at our data oh I'll give you some little qual qualitative data in a as we continue to take a look at our data I think um, we want to create some dashboards for faculty members to give them some information about uh, you know what's going on in their course. There is data, like on the Coursera platform, there's a lot of information, but it's a little hard to see. It's a little hard to see in a time series kind of way, which is important as you're teaching course over time. Um, and we've been working with Coursera to kind of create this for us. So we get a better handle on what's going on in individual courses to inform faculty members and help us make decisions about future courses. So we too have lovely stories uh, about uh, from both a faculty perspective and a student perspective in terms of you know some qualitative information. So I think Peter Strzok, who, who taught our very, very popular Greek and Roman mythology course, I think really put it right in terms of what's happening here in on, open online learning. Um, you know, if you really start taking this down, down, you know, down the line, what the impacts are. What are the impacts for our classrooms if we're really flipping our classrooms? What does the class really consist of? What is the semester? I mean, you could get really deep into this kind of thing. It will be interesting to see. Uh, how far universities go into this space, but I think there's a lot, can be a lot of implications for in real life learning as well as teaching and learning out in the, in, in the uh, universe here. We had an autistic student in our modern and contemporary uh, American poetry course who has not been able to traditionally take um, classes and go to school, but he can type, and he can type well, and he has, he has thoughts. And so he was able to participate fully in uh, our, our class, and here he is meeting with our professor at uh, Alfield Race at Kelly Ryder's house. Um, we also have a bunch of student feedback. You know, again, I, I think one of the most interesting things is that people love this poetry class. I mean, there's, there's a Facebook, there's a Facebook page, there's a Twitter page. Uh, I, I, you know, you, you think of more applied courses like you know programming courses and so on and so forth, or op, even operations management. People love this class. Um, design students, again, we have so on and so forth. And then I, I think this is interesting talking about the older age group. Uh, I think you heard Ed say we had, we found out some of the people who took the modern contemporary American poetry course uh, were in a uh, assisted living facility together in North Jersey. That's why we had that large, those couple of people of 80 and 90. Um, so, you know, and here's an older student. Uh, here's an alum who really feels a sense of pride about what's going on in, on their campus. And again, sort of the global view as well, talking about, you know, this is really important for me to learn this all over the world. So uh, these are these are heartening stories, and I think they're not only stories, but there's something in there in the data that we need to think about and as we assess what we're doing and where we go from here. So um, uh, in some ways, teach, I, I, I've done a lot of technology, teaching and learning and technology for many years, and I also really love data, so this is almost like the best of all possible worlds, uh, you know, and the fact that you can do big data because technology has improved and the access to tools and cloud computing and like 
don't get me going. But anyway, um, uh, you know, I, what we want to do with our data, we're definitely in the f- in phase one, right? We're gathering, we're taking a look at uh, in, reten- engagement, retention, so on and so forth. We, we, we were thinking in terms of marketing our courses, uh, yeah, you know, we really, we, we want to talk about pen open learning and thinking about what we offer to the world as the University of Pennsylvania. Coursera is a great platform. It's a platform, you know, as we think about going forward, we really want to brand our pen open courses. Again, thinking about how we use this data in a variety of ways going forward and you know, one of the things we'd love to be able to do with some of the things we've learned, some of the analytics, is to really think about uh, you know efficiency as of courses. We don't need to reinvent the wheel every time, so you leave time for innovation within courses, and some of the stuff we can leave the same. I really do think there's going to be a whole new, bo- in addition to kind of learning analytics and so on and so forth, the body, the, the amount of, you know, we could be really looking at seminal articles in many research areas if you think about consumer preferences, psychology, uh, you know, uh, you know. Uh, consumer behavior, uh, other business, you know, there's so many pieces that, that beyond just sort of your learning metrics, I think that these data provide that, um, you know, the opportunity for research is very, very rich in this area. So uh, quickly, a uh, few more things we're doing. So we are all about evangelizing. We're very much in kind of evangelistic mode on campus. So we are hosting Coursera's inaugural partners conference in two weeks. Um, figuring out, learning more about our students, uh, developing relationships with them so they learn more about all the courses we have at Penn. Very interested in working with you and your institutions uh, in many ways about this brand new area. And then uh, we've just launched our Penn Open Learn website, which is up here. You're welcome to take a look at it. You can follow us on Twitter and uh, to continue um, talking to us about this great adventure.